Welcome to the No Fear Podcast and the No Fear Live Broadcast. I'm your host, Tony Lauer. If you're into mindset training, performance psychology, personal development, you'll dig this new format. No Fear Live is a unique broadcast and it's different from the No Fear Podcast. We decided to go live because we wanted to create the opportunity to interact with people like you all over the world where anyone can log in and ask questions and in some cases you may even get invited into the show. The great thing about the live broadcast is that it's much more personal for the listener. That's you. Remember, self-defense isn't always about a confrontation with someone else. The first and most important fight is winning the one inside your head. Ta-da! My buddy, Dennis Benino, how are you, man? I just want to know why I saw a podcast episode in your trailer where you have no shirt on, but yet we're here today and you have a shirt on. This is, this right, is very but, unfair. But underneath this shirt is a no shirt. I'm nude underneath the shirt. And yeah, I'm that's, what wearing... I, that's what I mean. I don't want to. I'm, yeah. not, wearing, I'm not wearing any pants, man. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised. The, this is okay. That's our show, folks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> dude, who are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for being having me on your show. I'm pumped yeah. to be here. No, of, of, of course. I mean, we've been seeing a lot of each other. Uh, we're probably sick of each other right now. We saw each other in Nashville a couple weeks ago, and then I was on your show last week, and now you're on, on our show here. I think it's time for us to uh, get serious about our relationship. I'm going to move in. Where should I put my toothbrush? I'm going to show you where to put it, and I'm going to film it when I, <laughs> when I tell you where to put it. <laughs> This is called a cavity shirt from the retired police officer. Um, right. The uh, so for people, <clears throat> my audience is a lot of cops, a lot of military, a lot of uh, tactical athletes. Um, we do it during the day, so we don't get a lot of a lot of viewers because for some reason people work. I don't know why, um, but uh, but we then we share this all over the place. And uh, again, if you're uh, if you're logging into the show, please tell us where you're from. And if you are also in public safety and everywhere, let us know what service you're, you're from, because depending on how the call goes, you know, we'll, we'll answer any questions you have. But I want to tell you a little bit about Dennis and how we came together. So street cop training is like blowing up the law enforcement training world. And Dennis is the, uh, the mastermind behind, behind that. Uh, do you have partners in that company? Like in terms of the, um, you know, the, like the brainchild side of it? I don't mean financial or anything like that. I have no partners. Wow. That's even more impressive. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, we'll, 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 I got a bunch of questions for you, but the I just went to their conference last week. So a lot of, a lot of you, of course, know me through my work with law enforcement, military, and, and public safety, and martial arts, and blah, blah, blah. And I go to, over the years, I've gone to a ton of conferences, everything from Trexpo to SHOT Show to smaller, regional. I've never seen anything like I saw um, last week in Nashville, two weeks ago in Nashville. Guys, I, so the biggest event I ever talked in front of was an ASLED, American Society of Law Enforcement Trainers uh, Conference. They're no longer in business. Were you around when they were around? Were you a cop? You ever hear of ASLED? Or I mean, you, I don't know what year they were around, but oh, one is when I started my career. But I, there's to this day, people will bring up other training companies. And I'm like, guys, I... I don't sit on the internet all day trying to figure out who's what, what do they do? Right. Um, I typically hear about training companies when they spend time trying to talk smack about ours. Right. And they're like, Hey, do you know so-and-so from this state who teaches like how to sniff feet said that you're an asshole because like you, I'm like, okay. You know, nice. can I curse on this podcast? I can, right. You, I Too mean, late. the sign behind you says fuck fear. So <laughs> you cannot swear. Um, but anyways, let me talk about your thing, and I'll tell everyone how shit your conference was. Um, <laughs> um, so I went to this thing here, not knowing what to expect, and this is what I saw. Like, this is insane. I have never seen this many cops uh, in the room, uh, and, and, and speakers from Tommy Lauren to Jason Redman to, but more importantly than this uh, is, um, let me go back to this one because I love that picture. Um, I love that. I actually want that picture. Do we have the yeah, picture? I'll send it to you. Uh, I post. I posted it on my Instagram. Thanks, man. I appreciate I'll, that. I'll send it to you guys. Um, you don't follow me on Instagram? What the fuck, man? I follow you on Instagram. How do you think so I found you? 
I told I found you, Mr. Blauer. You did discover me under a rock. I, well, let's go. We we actually have to unpack this a little bit. We got to go back and see who discovered who because I uh, vaguely remember you reaching out to me, but we might have followed you or something like that. So it's interesting. This could be yeah. a uh, we'll have to might have to explore this a little bit. The the so anyways back 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 to so in case you guys haven't figured out, Dennis and I have this like intense sexual chemistry banter that goes back and forth you could you could cut this the tension with a knife huh <laughs> um but so I, uh, what i'm saying is i've been to for th you know like i've been in the industry for for over three decades started teaching full-time law enforcement in 1993 at this aslet event the biggest uh i don't remember doing a presentation in 1995 to like every single cop in attendance there and there was maybe 450 trainers in in the audience uh, and maybe 600 total. It was the biggest it ever got. Your first gig at 1,000, how many were at last, the, the Nashville gig? Did you get a fight? We were in the ballpark of north of 1,500 in attendance. Um, and what's important, and everyone listening to this, what I need you to understand is, uh, like, while there were no doubt trainers in there, these were cops trying to become safer and more educated, more motivated, more resilient in their, in their, in their uh, jobs. I mean, and they sat there like a lot of conferences are a day and a half, two days, and it's drinking and partying and vendors. This was like five days. And I think you had like four and a half days of classes, correct? Yes. Yeah. Insane. Amazing. So, uh, uh, like it's amazing. So if you're reading between the lines there, guys, you need, you need to check this out. It's not surprising to me um, that you've got the haters and the naysayers and all that. Um, do you think it's just because you're from New Jersey or, or are you just making people feel insecure? Why do you think that is? I think it's the icing on the cake that I'm from Jersey because I think everybody <laughs> started to hate this state uh, <laughs> right about circa 2005 when a certain show came out that I am proud to announce I have been on episodes of it. And um, even more as uh, as recent as three or four years ago. So if you watch the Angelina's wedding episode, you will see me strategically placing myself in camera shot and my wife at the time saying, why are you so insistent on being on camera on this thing? And I said, because we have a couple hundred thousand people who know who I am and I'm going to pretend like it wasn't me for about a month and it's going to be hysterical. Uh, funny. Very so yes, yes. So I think that, um, I think one thing is that I'm probably misinterpreted because of my jerseyness. They right. immediately make a judgment call because of how I display myself, my foul language, my confident personality. Um, these things serve you very well as a man in New Jersey, for sure. And right. I think serve you well in general. But yeah, so there's, there's a big misinterpretation on who I am, what my mission and objective is. Um, and, you know, I, I try to have a lot of compassion for people who spend a lot of time uh, slinging mud instead of trying to encourage change and maybe emphasizing what their skill sets might be. I dig it, man. Yeah. You said some things I won't say on, on the show because it takes the, the, the fornication language to another level when you're on stage. Uh, it was hysterical and everyone loved it and appreciated it. <laughs> I mean, it was just, <clears throat> you made, you made David Goggins uh, seem like a friggin' none um <laughs> just just it was it was it was classic um where did you get the uh, it's like this crazy confidence come uh from like to just do this to know that you could do it better and then just go for it i think i couldn't ignore the noise in my head that said just go for it i don't think i was ever sure that i could do it mm. um but I was somebody who would never just stand by and not do something right. uh, about a problem I saw. And this really wasn't a business thing, to be honest with you. This wasn't like a thing where I was like, yeah, I'm going to get rich off of this. I'm like, yo, I'm sick of watching these people that I work with, these agencies that we work with, not knowing anything about this job and these bad guys getting over and getting off. And what I recognize is that as people were field training with me, uh, and I've field trained several people, um, you know, probably in the ballpark of in my career because we, you know, the dynamic of our agency, maybe 10, maybe 10 people I field trained. 
the product that left my car after 12 weeks versus everybody else's was very different. So a lot of people mm -hmm. that I field train and, you know, as I started getting more field training experience, I started telling the command staff, Hey, if you have somebody that looks like they're promising, give me them because I can take this and make the, if they're a six now, I'll make them a nine in 12 weeks. And you'll be really happy with when I'm done. And I, you know, I'm proud to say that a lot of people that I did field train immediately went on to like narcotics task force and detective bureaus and were fast tracked to a lot of things. So I thought, man, if I could do this for somebody, we could probably do this for a lot of people. So it's a real why behind it. And then, you know, it expanded and blossomed from there to things that I would have never imagined uh, would come from this. Uh, crazy. What the, um, just for some background for people new to you, uh, how long were you a cop? I became a cop when I was, I was 19 when I started in the police academy. I turned 20 in the police academy in 01. So I was born in 1981. Um, it was right after 9-11 here in New Jersey in Bergen County about wow. maybe about I mean, you could still see the smoke while I was at police academy. That smoke was going for a while. So you could stand on the hill at Mawa, look down 46 and see New York City. So it was right there. Um, and then I progressed in my career for I went to three police academies. So I started out at a Department of Corrections here at a very young age. Realized very quickly that I was not going to be staying here and. Then I took a job at the feds. Now, people don't know that, hey, why didn't you just become a cop first? New Jersey at that time, it was very difficult, very competitive. And a, law, a corrections officer in the state of New Jersey is a sworn law enforcement officer. They actually have police on their patches. So some states they're sworn. Some states they're called detention officers. Uh, all still the same job. All still deserve the same credit. But for about every one job that came up that an agency would announce, there's about 1,000 people applying to that job. I'm not wow. kidding you. So a thousand applicants competing. So I started to understand the system, but I also recognized that I had to take what I, what I could get. And then a job came up with a federal agency, U S park police. And they said, Hey, if you take a job in DC, we'll bring you back to New Jersey in two years. And I said, well, I'm, I'm 22. Uh, so I'll do that deal. So I went to my second police Academy. I went to the federal law enforcement training center for uh, almost six months. And then while I was at this, uh, at this police agency, the agency that I grew up in uh, and wanted to work for, my hometown, started having a mass hiring. So I was able to get a position with them in one of the first rounds. So they hired 13 and 13. I was in the second round of that. But unfortunately, I had to go back to a third police academy in less than five years. So at that time, they were calling me the professional recruit. But, yeah. you know, I knew it was all for a reason. I'd watch in police academy. I'm like, man. This is so bad. It could be so much better. And in my third academy, I was making a lot of suggestions to the command staff, so much so that they were getting very frustrated with me. And they almost found it ca comical at some point. They're like, what now? And I'm like, well, I don't understand why we're doing this. And they're like, well, what do you mean? We've been doing this way for like 15 years. I'm like, but it doesn't make sense. Nobody does this right. on the street. Right. Why are you guys doing it this way? And they're like, and here's the great stuff. As much as they fucking hated that, they actually would change it. Uh, they mm. actually, I, I got to give them credit. The academy was complete garbage but when i made suggestions they thought about it and said here's a guy who actually makes more sense than what we're doing and they've implemented uh at that time they implemented a few changes i was the only person making suggestions right um uh, and you know of course then you get the stigma oh the big mouth he wants to change everything he knows everything no i just saw a better way to do it right and right. and maybe my my approach could have been better i don't know but you know certainly i was like man we're just wasting time so I would. I think it's a blessing now to have been a recruit three times to mm -hmm. know exactly what it feels like many times over, what works, what doesn't, in all the settings. Yeah, no, great answer. And as you were saying that, I could see the tapestry of, you know, the 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 pieces of the puzzle that have created you and and street cop. I mean, most cops don't do different academies like that, and so as a result of that, you saw the best and the worst. Uh, the fact that you're from Jersey, you had the, you know, the 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 courage to go. What the fuck are we doing here? Uh, you know, had you know, had you been from uh, uh, Palm Beach, Florida, you wouldn't have said shit. And most cops, even from Jersey, uh, when you're in your first academy, you just want to pass. You're just doing what people are saying. Like I want to check in the box. I'm not going to rock the boat. You're not going. Most people wouldn't have the confidence their first time through to go. Why are we doing this? you know, after your second or third. So I, I can see like all of those like uh, moving parts coming together 
to create the entrepreneur that 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 is Dennis now. Um, it's uh, it's interesting because when I was watching and listening to the courses at the event, so many of them were like active duty uh, operators with a ton of experience talking as if you were like you know having a beer after work going this fucker had this hidden over here who would have thought to look there but now i know and it was like just sharing insights um whereas a lot of conferences are just about selling a book or selling a service uh and 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 uh, uh or i mean i i mostly went to training conferences where i i can remember walking into a conference and watching a demo that nobody could pull off like do you get so choreographed and then watching like 50 cops on some control and arrest uh, uh i call it control and arrest most cops call it arrest and control but you got to control somebody before you can arrest them but that's another story uh uh like doing things where i'd be standing there like i'd walk in the room to see this famous instructor and he was great and then all the all the cops in the room were like looking at each other going how do you do that move like they couldn't even remember the thing they had just seen and now they think that they're going to be able to pull that off at two in the morning during a fight um it always blew my mind so the distinction there is what i saw you doing and now that i hear some of your background which i hadn't heard before uh like it's like you've really almost taken the the best and promised yourself not to ever present the worst and brought that into street cop. And it's like, here's practical shit that'll keep you alive. That'll make the arrest happen faster. That's going to help you write win fight three. We always talk about the three fights. First fight is between you and you. Second fight is you and the bad guy. Third fight is you and internal affairs and mainstream media and the fucking narrative. And uh, like, like I saw that the whole week in Nashville. I thought it was amazing. When you talk about the conference, you know, I think that I also hear a question, which we're kind of dancing around with a little bit, is what was the motivation for the conference, which is a little bit of a different conversation. Yeah. And I'll try to explain this from a, a business standpoint. So I'll acknowledge that, yes, I, I spend a lot of my time in my entrepreneurial development, and I make a fuck ton of mistakes, but I also spend an ungodly amount of hours a day, constant self-education to be better at this. So- with that being said, why did I want to throw a conference? And you keep saying it over and over again because they're all so fucking bad. I mean, I've been invited to keynote I, them. And I'm like, I say that? Guys? <laughs> yeah, basically. So, uh, you know, for the most part, a lot of them are 95% of them, you know, are just, just not produced well. They're not thought out. And we don't have it licked 100%. But – you know, people, I don't know what they're thinking when they put these things together. And this is what differentiates us from, I guess, other conferences. Not all of them, but most of them. I want to make sure that this conference is for you. And I tell people that. They say, can I get a picture with you? I go, you can get 28 pictures with me. You can come back to me tomorrow and every single day and ask me to take different poses because you paid the fee to come here. And this is your experience. That's what you guys paid for. Nothing about this week has anything to do with me. This is my job. I know, I, I know that you guys appreciate it, but so the first conference and the second conference felt very different because now the first time was the first experience and like getting all that feedback and you're seeing all the work you've done for years coming back at you. Now it's like, we already know that's going to exist. My goal is to make sure that when you walk out those doors on Friday, you go, this was amazing. And I don't have to market anywhere past that because already mm -hmm. all we hear two weeks later is, hey, I came back and told seven of my coworkers and the chief we're all already signed. We sold 600 tickets for next year. It's two weeks. Wow. To be announced. wow. So 600 have been sold thus far. I told my chief he's sending seven. I'm so all these things, when you focus on your product and remove you from the equation, that's where – and I don't want to say the gold – but the gold of the experience, people can make remarks and it's memorable. So it's what makes something remarkable. It's worth speaking about. 
at the same time, there was another conference uh, that I don't care about, but somebody came up to me and said, hey, oh, I got a friend at this other conference, and he said it's horrific. I go, well, clearly that conference must be horrific because the dude's programs are horrific. You know what I mean? So, like, what do you think he's going to just – and they're just right. trying to copy what we're doing. And they can – you know, we give all our stuff away. You can have it. You can share it. People get concerned. Oh, you can share your stuff. You can have anything you want, but you'll never have us. You just will never have me. You'll never have the staff here, the wonderful human beings that work at this building that work tirelessly for everybody's experience, and all the instructors who are fantastic and amazing human beings that I'm so proud of. And I, I got to tell you, if you hear emotion in my voice, it took a long time to get here to have such a profound group of people to work with that are essentially changing the world. And a lot of people, when they left the conference, said, you changed my life in a week. Wow. What we delivered on what we promised. Yeah, no, it's amazing. It's funny because you, you, my um, fourth question, we had one, you know, how long were you cop? You know, one, we, which we didn't ask, but I'll ask soon. Were you always interested in business? How long did you start Street Cop? Street Cop was 2012? Yes, sir. When did it? Okay. Um, but then my next big question was, what problem were you trying to solve in the industry? And we in, naturally talked about that through you telling the, you, the background. But if you well, want to Let me give you the overall it, macro yeah. answer to that. Yeah, please. Cops are shortchanged and given crap training and then expected to perform. And when they can't, they're held accountable. It yeah. is probably one of the most raw deals in the world that these men and women are begging for answers and begging for training and will not get it. But as soon as they mess up, their administration denied training will wash their hands clean and say, well, we were sent to an academy. They should have known better. These academies overall, I do not have, and you really understand this, it's a very audacious thing to say and to my detriment a lot that I say these things, but they have to be talked about they will never have the capacity to deliver a product like we can. It's impossible. They just, mm -hmm. on the mere semantics, if I broke it down to you, they just don't even have the personnel. So we know going forward, and I know this in my heart, that you're probably going to see, once we can get people convinced to relinquish this requirement of a certification off to people who can actually give practical value. Sure. Once that starts to shift and occur, I would think that, most police academies outside of in-person physical requirements that hopefully will change in I'll some sense. You. Yeah. Uh, you'll probably have some kind of digital platform and people get very upset. Oh, digital. I don't want to go to a police academy and watch something on a screen. I watch YouTube videos while I drink coffee every morning. I sometimes, if I find something interesting on YouTube, I'll play it while I'm playing, while I'm working out in the gym, if I'm not doing a podcast or an audio book, but also, if you've ever been to a police academy, you'll know that I would rather watch a Simon Sinek one hour video of leadership from the best leadership, thoughtful guy there is who can help mold us as a profession moving forward than some dude who was told, hey, run down to the academy. Here's the stick you put in the computer. There's a PowerPoint on it already. Just read off the PowerPoint. And people are asking these guys questions like, so what does that mean? Like, I don't know. They don't have experts. They have right. somebody they found. And once in a while, you'll get somebody who's really good at an academy who will actually show up, and it's finally a relief. For the 3% of the academy, 5% of the academy, where somebody actually knows what they're talking about, it's a relief. And I got to tell you, I wish it wasn't this way. I just wish it wasn't, and it is. And we're not waiting for politicians to change things. We're not sitting here because inadvertently police academies are killing Cops. They don't even know that, but they are sure. because nobody's taking the ball and fixing it. And I can promise you, and I stand here to this day to say to you, I know for a fact the efforts of everybody at this company has kept a lot of names off that wall in Washington, D.C. I fucking know that for a fact. So yeah. we take that very seriously and they don't. So you can do your thing. We'll do our thing. And the cool thing is we also accept payment from non-government entities like cops who want to go get this training so they are there with their kids at their next birthday and christmas because they are not they can't sit around and wait to be picked for training that could that could essentially save your life yep yep i love that that was a great rant man and uh it was it reminded me of a study that uh um 
another i'm not going to mention the group because i don't know which group you hate but uh but uh, they're a big group and they they did a study on three different continents that uh it was millions of dollars probably spent cumulatively uh evaluating it but uh, uh basically determined that the training cops receive aren't preparing them for the violence they meet i'm paraphrasing that it sounded like a little poem there uh but what was amazing is uh somebody sent me the link to this article and i was like I've been saying that since the fucking eighties. I would I would say it's not what you believe, it's what you see, and what you see is CCTV. If we don't see the the training that you were taught in the academy manifesting every day in a body cam, in in a dash cam, if you don't see it, then the training is flawed. People, bad guys aren't attacking. Uh, indiscriminately random, like weird, different things. It's always the same sort of attack. It's always the same sort of fucking pre-contact cues. And the training is just so mediocre at best. Uh, and um, it's it still blows my mind, even to this day, because I was going to ask you if you felt, uh, but you've already answered it, but I, you always you always can go deeper. I love, I love your brain can do that. You can go down different layers. Is, is you would think that, that every year the training would get better and it still doesn't I, I i would i would tell people when they would watch videos of officers getting slain in the line of duty or their ass kicked in the line of duty and i would say who are you watching during this video and everyone's watching the cop i go why are you watching the cop only the bad guy can tell you if your agency's tactics are worth any shit it's because you're naturally, if you're watching two football teams, you're watching the team that you like. And that's the cop in the uniform. So only the bad guy can tell you what you're doing. I saw, this whole thing is a, it's stirring up a lot of emotion in me because I've been yelling at the industry for decades. And, and had uh, uh, I invented haters back in the 90s. That term didn't even exist. It was, it was inspired by me. I, I, uh, but... I had guys, if I told you some of the people at, in 1993, Gary Klugowitz, who was the chairman of Aslet at the time, and he was the guy that kind of started the Red Man force on force training uh, uh, gear. He, he discovered me in another meeting, had the at least uh, integrity to bring me to this conference in Dallas. I was living in Canada at the time, but I had guys sitting in my classroom, big name trainers. Masada, you was there, all these, all these like big names from back then. And I'm saying, hey, there's no such thing as reactionary gap. Your training doesn't work. You guys have this backwards, like your your actions faster than reaction, but then you all of your training is hey, when the bad guy does this, you do that. You're violating fucking physics when you train like that. You need to be preemptive. You need to, you need to work the anticipatory cells of the brain, blah, 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 blah. And people are sitting there, we had a break during my three hour talk halfway through half of the, and this is only instructors, half of the instructors didn't come back after the break. Fucking insane. But anyways, you got me all fired. The, up, man. No, it's because the truth hurts, dude. And that's why things don't change because yeah. nobody's willing to admit that they don't know what to do. And somebody you, else might actually have the answers. You said something that I want to, I want to go back to. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I think everybody yeah. also like, like loves the taste of their own Kool-Aid, right? So like they don't want to taste yours. It could taste better, but they they put a lot of effort into their Kool-Aid. So let me drink this shit and God forbid any else anybody else bring something to the table. And just real quick before we progress, no. I don't want to mess your brain up. I don't hate any groups. I don't associate with some because they wish to not associate with me. When I came into this industry, uh, arms wide open, want to be friends with everybody. I felt like we could all do things together. But again, it's the same thing. Now they're feeling threatened. So I try to really have empathy for why somebody would feel hatred towards me. And I could understand why. No competition ever before. Now all of a sudden somebody shows up and they're taking, in your mind, market share. And there's plenty for everybody. Yeah. So now somebody's taking your market share. But that's the beauty of business. I say this a thousand times over. He who has the best product will win. Does you know, and, and it's there's a lot to unpack with that one, but also 
I don't like people spewing hate towards me, so I would be just as guilty to spew hate towards others. I'm only acknowledging the truth when I talked about that guy's conference right. that was going at the same time as ours. There's no hatred being spewed that way. The fact of the matter is it's a crap product, and I know it is. And there's and I and I like if this person actually could behave as a human being, which they cannot, um, they would have been smart enough to say, hey, maybe we should do something together. Maybe you can give me a little guidance. Dude, I do free coaching and guiding for so many people. I, I'm just an open book with that stuff. If I have the time now, it's getting a little interesting. But so I'm not saying anything that's not true. Just that people right. don't like to hear the truth. Like when right. I say to you, hey. You know, I've been like right now it's May in New Jersey. So everybody's been losing weight. <laughs> like everybody I'm seeing, I'm like, you losing weight? And they're like, yeah, I lost like 10 pounds. I'm like, that's cool. Like, that's the truth. But like, when I also say to you, like, you got fat. What you do? <laughs> right. That's also the truth. So, right. you know, um, as nice as the accolades that we've received for the experience of the conference, a vendor, one of the vendors out of the 30 that were there was unhappy and sent over a critical thing. They're not mad with us, just how can we improve? And so mm -hmm. I'm going to make it right by them. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do, but I'm going to make it. You just froze, damn it. I have to take into account that like not everything I did at that conference was perfect. And right. on the surface, people were like, it was amazing. It was perfect yet. Yeah. But behind the scenes, there were things we could have done better that will right. adjust for next time to make this even better. And for the vendors, I'm listening to what they'd like to see more of. And I have to acknowledge it. Like, yeah, we fucked that up a little bit. So we're going to fix it. That's all yeah. it is. So That's I'm not true. disillusioned to the fact that I think I'm perfect. I'm not. But I can tell you that every fucking day I'm trying to get better, trying to understand what my downfalls are, what I can, you know, who, what are people not liking about me? Now, I can't change the authenticity of who I am and how I speak, right. but I have to listen to some of it to say, is any of this actually true? And sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes it is. And that's, you say very rarely, that sounds like a real fucking, uh, you know, something who's conceited would say, no, no, no. It's, if you listen to every, you know, if you throw a stone at every dog that barks, you'll never make your way to your destination. So, you know, uh, some of it you got to hear, and most of it you got to just cast off. I, no, I, I, I dig it. And, I, and, you know, as as you talk, I realize how, uh, uh, in, in uh, take this take this as as a compliment because i'm turned 63 last week like like i love so much of your energy and personality and uh uh the melancholy part of the poet in me goes man i, w I wish we had linked up 30 years ago uh when i had the energy you have now um but the uh you know i i would i would always joke that um in my industry, I was the uh, uh, Dennis Miller meets Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, you know, just always swearing and always fucking this. And, and I was an idea freak, a suggestion freak that weak minded people interpreted as a control freak. I go, I don't give a fuck what you do. People would be at my seminar, Dennis, and they go, could I do this? Could I do this? I go, you could do whatever fuck you want in a fight and you'll find out if it works after. Or because you paid money, you could... Listen to me, do this, try it, go home, test it, and do what you want. I don't give a fuck, but why are you stopping the seminar to show me what you, what you would do? Like, I wouldn't do that at your seminar. Um, it's just weird. It goes back to your, your, your people love the taste of their Kool-Aid idea. But people don't want to hear, and I, and, you know, you went off, you did a little rant on the word hate there. I'm, a, I'm dramatic. I'm, I'm, a, you know, my, um, I, I'm. It was a strong word, and I probably, I probably shouldn't have used it. And but I'm glad that you uh, kind of illuminated your 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 position on that. I'm um, very very similar. There are so many people that that in like high level people. If I told you some of these who like trash me, who I got to the point where I started to to sign off all my articles. Don't hate me, hate the bad guy. I'm only telling you the truth. If if there were no violence in the world, I'd be good with that. If I would, if I woke up tomorrow and somebody said, "Look, there's no more violence. You can't teach counter ambush, self defense," I'd be fine with that because I know that I'm uh, 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 driven enough to figure out how to find something else cool to do. 
right? The fact that there is violence, I'm doing, I'm doing what, uh, what I love, what my passion, what my calling is. Okay, let's move on to um, something else. You, you said something there, and I'm trying to recall it because I want to unpack that a little bit more. You know, you said these agencies are inadvertently killing cops. It's a very heavy statement, and, and I agree with it. 100% I agree with it. You're putting people in harm's way, and there are, there are legal statutes of deliberate indifference and failure to train adequately. You know that the shit's out there, and you're not doing it. You're thinking this is good enough. The training hasn't changed. There's there's new sciences in how we can learn better in, in brain-based learning, uh, uh, things that we can do in de-escalation, more mental health, more fitness stuff. And people are still doing fucking jumping jacks and line drills and shit like that. And the bad guys are getting more and more brazen. Um, what, aside from like you're, you're providing all of this amazing education with people, uh, what are some of the changes that you would make of, if someone said, Dennis, redesign this recruit program like what are some essential changes you would make right away if you could are there like are there black and whiters or too many yeah no it's i mean let's pick three okay right, let's start with three there's there's 84 but let's pick three to start <laughs> right. right so you've alluded to earlier the days of taking a stick out opening it up and striking a bag and screaming get back for 15, 20 sessions in the academy. So you're talking about 15, 20 hours of wasted time. Um, this is completely irrelevant. But this is, this is, we'll never in our lives take out a stick while your friend holds a bag and scream, get back. The sticks don't work. Um, and I'm not naming a company because I am I could just feel that one coming. Right. Um, because they've already reached out to me to like, we're not that company, we're this company. I'm like, it's the same fucking stick that nobody uses. It just Busting up lumbar six on your back for no reason. That's the first one. Uh, that's I don't I don't know what's the first one. I'm going to grade these all equally. Uh, number two, I can prove, and you weren't there for day one, but I literally had 45 minutes to talk for day one because, again, I wanted to give the platform to other people who don't get to hear from these folks all the time to put their message out there because mine's redundant. more thought put into traffic stops and namely in a very, very macro sense, we need to be off the driver's side and on the passenger side out of the vehicle around the back of the vehicle. And then if you want to really elaborate on that, beginning to slice the pie, looking inside the car before you approach the car, the complacency. And I hate to use that word. And we talked about this in the last podcast, how much it gets diluted because you hear that over and over again, it loses its value. But every time we have somebody on this show or my show, who was shot in the line of duty happened just two days ago. They talked about complacency. Everybody brings it up. Even the military men and women who were significantly injured, they talked about complacency. So the complacency that, that is employed in this old school tactic of there's one way to do a traffic stop. It's on the driver's side, but people who like the way things used to be in a romantic with the past do not want to deviate and say, Oh, I can, I can, I can see your point here. We should change it. So that's two things. And I'll say even for a third thing, and you'll get people really worked up on this one, the marching in the academy is absurd. Um, and people are like, that's fucking bullshit. Marching's important. Maybe for the military. Maybe, just maybe. But for civilian-style interaction police academies, the idea that we spend a lot of time on parade and dress and learning how to do movements for essentially what comes down to the only time you'll ever use that in your life is for a three-minute graduation ceremony. You're going to walk out, sit, get up, get your shit, come sit back down, and then once you're done, you're getting dismissed, and you're all going to march out again. Well, we'll spend 20, 30 hours in an academy on learning how to march so your grandmother thinks you really went through it. Uh, and, half the, and, and guess what? You're never going to march again in your life. So we've wasted all that time. People say, well, military bearing is important. I think you can put people under stress. And you can, I mean, if you watch the Navy SEALs and, and when they go to Bud School, you don't have guys with big brim hats on screaming in their face. Now, I get there's a time and place for this. I'm not going to have this conversation. What I'm saying is, for us, yes, I think that you should endure stress on people. But do I think it needs to be the way that you're enduring it? There has to be bearing and some respect for the instructors. I get that part. But we can, we can introduce stress in many other ways that are more practical 
than running around with 150 pound bags and beating people up for the first 10 days of the academy. Uh, stress is important because I understand why it has to occur. Because then later on, when you hit those scenarios as a police officer, you're going to know where you can dig into, how much further you can go. You survived this before in a much more controlled environment. Um, and it was worse. But the reality is, is a lot of this stuff is just, Tone, I have this idea, and I'm going to, this will be the last 20 seconds before you go. I look at some of these academy programs and I say, I, I, I just almost know where it comes from. Three people sat around and said, hey, you know, we got to come up with something. Uh, I don't know, Joan, what do you want to do? Shit. Um, what do you got on the belt there? I got handcuffs. All right, let's do a class on handcuffs. So it's, uh, and you go to academy, every academy teaches a class on handcuffs. You spend four hours in the nomenclature of a handcuff. Here's where the key goes. And yeah, we fucking know where the key goes, right? And I always say in class, and this goes on and on, right? What do, what do you want to do next? I don't know. We've got pepper spray. Oh, fuck it. Spray them. Let them, which I do think is important. I think you should be sprayed in the academy. No doubt in my mind, you need to be pepper sprayed. If you're not getting pepper sprayed, you and your friends should get together and pepper spray yourself because you're going to get fucking pepper sprayed. You better know what it's like. That I will agree with 100%. But like, you know, going over the hydraulic needle effect, if you hold it in somebody's eyeball, the damage it can do to the retina, like, come on, guys. What are we, the different size cans of spray? Just so we are checking boxes, but not, not accomplishing anything. And it's, it's, it's just so absurd. It serves almost no purpose. And the crazy thing is every cop is told the same thing. You ask any cop you meet. Before you go to the academy, your command staff will sit you and say, hey, you're going to this academy. You're going to learn nothing. You learn nothing. When you come back, you'll learn the job. And then actually even a lie as well. We can go into that if you want. But you're literally every cop in this country is prefaced before they go to the academy. They're prepped to know that you're going to go there and this is a waste of five to six months or four months, whatever your academy is. You're about to waste four to five to six months. You're going to learn absolutely nothing. And you the crazy shit is they deliver on that promise. They've hmm. never disappointed with the fact that you come back and go, how the fuck? Not one person I've ever met in my life ever learned how to catch bad guys in the police academy. So I say that in my classes, I go, how many of you in this room have, when you were in the police academy, learned how to catch a criminal? And I go, and for the 87th time, not one hand goes up. So how do we go to an academy or an institution and not learn how to fight crime? But I guarantee you, half of you know how to shine shoes, do push-ups, call cadence, do right flank rights, and, uh, and you know, know how to swing a, a stick in a bag, which you'll never do. All these things you'll never do. And we're just checking boxes. And, that, and unfortunately, that's where people lose their lives. It's this wonderful opportunity to have, create such a better product. And mm. now I'm thinking more of like, I know it's not just us. And that's where my brain's going for street cop training as a larger company. Like I know nurses go through this and doctors and, and firemen and, and every prof realtors, you know, go do the job. Well, where's the training? <clears throat> like real estate school. I, was, I ran a real estate team for a little bit. I don't teach anything about real estate. <laughs> like it's just continue education. It's, it's dreadful. So we are now looking at continuing education, how to make, we know you got to do it. Why don't we make it good? Right. And, and right. that translates to everybody. You're an attorney. Let's make it good. Let's make it. So you go to, you look forward to your CE credits and you actually learn something instead of sitting there like real estate. They do a thing in Jersey where essentially like one of the courses you can take is like realtor safety, how to know when you're about to get raped and murdered as a realtor. You know, like, what are we doing guys? You know, like what the fuck are we doing? And that's my, my rant's over. It's awesome. It's awesome. And it's funny because, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned Simon Sinek before and nobody's explaining why we do things. Uh, and, and, uh, if you started with the why, like he says, you would suddenly have this Socratic pause where you look at each other and go, what the fuck are we doing? Right. Uh, the, the, uh, I always make this, this, this joke. Like there was a time when, when battle was like, there were codes to it. Like I'd ride up to you on a horse and I go, Dennis, this is your last chance to surrender. And then we're going to fuck you up. And you go, fuck you, man. And I'd ride back and someone blow. Like it was organized. It's not like that. So you didn't, you know, like even then, you know, the outliers were going, why are we standing in a line here? Let's fucking sneak up at night and kill the guy here. And, you know, there's always people going like, this is stupid lining up like this and fighting like this. Um, I agree with everything you said. You know, when we do our scenario training, you know, I, 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 I tell guys, 
you're training in a line, you're throwing punches like martial artists and boxers at each other. People don't move like that in the street. What would it cost you in U.S. currency or whatever currency, you know, your, your, your country uses to have your role player stand and move like a bad guy? And if you're not sure, you've got body cam and CCTV and smartphone footage where you could like in a movie, replicate that, and that would educate your brain and inform you for what your pre-contact indicators are, and you better start fucking moving early. You got to understand the neurobiology, you got to stand, you got to stand the fear spike, and and people just aren't integrating this shit. In our scenario stuff, we talk about the three R's, realistic, relevant, rigorous. So if I look at stuff, I go, okay, you're doing this badge grab, and then you're pinning the hand here and doing an arm bar. In the history of policing, has a bad guy ever run up to a cop and grabbed their badge? No. <laughs> like, what are you, what are you, like, what are you doing? Do they stand? Like, when somebody grabs you, do they stand there while you, you do this move with your arm and come? No. Like, why? So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting and fascinating. So I love that. And we should go, we'll do another show where we get, we try to get to all 84, um, of those uh those things that are wrong uh the i want to just jump in real quick and say i saw yeah, a please. video yesterday i might have been pooping and uh on tiktok or whatever it may be whatever platform because i'm you know that's part of being a business person i'm not on tiktok for entertainment i'm really trying to understand the psychology behind a lot of the stuff and what's going to work for us and so there's this you know today is what may 11th is that what today is may 11th 2023 yeah. I think yesterday or the day before this video was released, and it's an MMA fight with two female mixed martial arts fighters. And they're interviewing the one girl who won. And I got to tell you, it's so interesting that mixed martial arts girls are so attractive. Isn't that weird that they're like, they're tough as fuck. And they're like, a lot of them are super hot. Isn't that weird? It's a weird thing, right? Anyway, we're like boxers. We're never look like that. Like boxers, like female boxers always look like real like. Anywho, so the one girl who lost is saying in the ring, in the octagon, She's boxing. She's boxing. That's what she's doing. She's boxing. She showed up trained to fight somebody who wasn't going to box. And that's what we're doing here. We are setting people up for failure. So she failed because she could not, she didn't even consider how formidable of a boxer this girl was. So when she wanted to wrestle, this girl started to box and beat the lift. And you watch her, the two Spanish girls, uh, she beat the shit out of her, and she fucking destroyed. Well, I, maybe the one girl's not spent. I know the one was because I heard her accent, and she's the prettier one anyway. And she's like, yeah, she's crazy. She's crazy. She don't – and she's right. So the rules are in, a, in real life that there are no rules, especially right. in a fight. You're fucking training for something that the other side's not playing on those rules, right? They're not going to get back when you swing a stick and tell them get back. That's not how the rules work. And every time I see a video of a cop taking a stick out and swinging it, they look like a fucking moron and they're falling down and there's nothing effective about it. And then every once in a while, here comes some fucking holy motherfucker on his white horse who like has been practicing with this stick for 23 years and is like, I'm effective with the stick. Great. There's 11 of you in the country that are effective with the right. stick. What happened to the other 749,989 people that need to learn how to fucking fight? What are we doing? here, Dude, I love it. And I have uh, part of the answer for you. We'll talk about it another time. Um, the uh, where's I, I was uh, I did a seminar for a bunch of cops this morning before our podcast, and I was telling them, I said, I said, you guys, you know, you're in a job that could literally kill you, right? It's dangerous. How many of you take your physical fitness and mental fitness seriously you're personal like if your agency is not going to pay for it you're not going to go but you know nobody pays for me as an aging athlete to stay in shape i don't like i don't draw money from blower tactical and go go to this course i would if there was no blower tactical and i worked at at mcdonald's i'd still be physically fit i'd still be training it's because i've got to take care of myself i said you know what i've been teaching cops since 1993 and there's always one in the class. I go, any questions? Always one on Monday that wants to know what time we get out. What time's lunch? What time? I said, I don't want to generalize, but you guys are the fucking laziest tactical athletes uh, there are. Of course, we've got our Rambos and we've got our Laura Crofts and everything. You know, there's one or two here. But how do we get 
because we're talking about a top down issue like the administrator. We, we, we need the people that have the purse strings, the funding, the organization, the clout to go, listen, we're going to get you better training. We're hiring Dennis and we're outsourcing all the training from there. How, what what is your answer or thoughts or philosophy on recruitment or personal onus and responsibility of the individual officer to go, you know what? Like you, you watch YouTube while you're working out, you're listening to an audio book, but you've always done that, right? Like that's, that's you, you're, you've always wanted to be better. So you became very effective as a police officer, but you'd have also been very effective, you know, as a painter, right? Like whatever you did, you'd go like, this is stupid. Why is the paint here? It should be over here. I don't have to get up and down the ladder. So what what are we, what are what are your thoughts on how do we uh, create a uh, uh, personal uh, responsibility uh, within the industry? Before I answer that question, and I think it's more of a business question more than a culture question. So before I I answer that question, just to paint a little dynamic of me, and this is not self boasting. Um, you know, I I believe I'm a unique character, uh, but I also think that being a unique character is a great way to I don't know. I'm no different than everybody else. And, and I'm just trying to exemplify every talent that I have and push myself to where I want to be. So, you know, you said if I was a painter, I was this. I used to own a barbershop and um, my partner on the barbershop said to me one day, he was cutting my hair and he said, uh, I didn't cut hair. I just was a partner in it. So he goes, Dan, if you had to be a barber, how long before you were the best barber in New Jersey? And I, without batting, I went two years. And he goes, I was going to say the same exact thing. I go, why is that? He goes, because, dude, you're just one of those guys that if you're going to do it, you're going to be the best at it. Here's the good news for everybody else. I suck at a lot. Pretty much everything. I'm a human being. I make fucking horrific mistakes. But what separates me, or at least I try to exemplify and set an example for other people, is that I'm continuing to work through those mistakes and trying to continually better myself. And the question is, how do we get people to not consider this or to consider this stuff important. And I think that there has to be a why, but people have to see the value. So when there's a value in something, and I'm probably not the right person to talk in this, there's probably people like Alex Hermosi and other significant business leaders that can unpack this a lot better. But if you said to me, and we see this, if you said to me, hey, who are you? Well, I'm a guy who wants to go out and we'll take it in the context of police training. I want to get guns and drugs. I want to get in car chase. I want better lockups. I want better. I want to make better arrests. I want to be this. I want to be that. That's great, man. We can get you there faster. We can save you about five years. And the and the the fee is two hundred and ninety nine dollars for a ten hour program. It's one day. And I promise you, by the time you're ten minutes into it, you'll be hooked and thankful you came there. So when you can see value in it, you're mm. going to enroll in it. Um. When you can't see value in it, so you take the same guy and say, hey, we also have another program. I don't know if you're interested in it, but essentially um, it's it's sensitivity training. We're going to explain the woke culture. Um, and, and you know, you're going to be better at knitting clothing and, and painting flowers on walls when you're done. Well, what's that guy going to say? Get the fuck out of here. Like, no way. No, but it's, it's even free. No, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. So what's the value when we're investing in something? And I think it's, I think it's a lot of times with everything, you know, what's the value when I spend time with my kids? It's not just for me, it's for them. So we're both equally getting value. Their father is very involved. It brings me joy and, and fulfillment. Not every piece of fulfillment in my life, you know what I mean? Like, there are many needs we have as human beings, but at the same time, what I do is I try to see what I look like from the view of my children. When I'm tired and they want to play, I hope this isn't like some crazy rant, but when I'm tired and they want to play, I think about how does that kid see me right now? They're not trying to annoy me because I'm tired. They're happy to see their dad and they want to play. So there's value in me understanding that and going into uncomfortability to be a great father for them. So when they're fucking 23 and they're sitting around telling a new girlfriend about, you're about to meet my dad. And I'm going to tell you, this dude is the fucking best. Hmm. And I put time and effort into being a great father. So 
it depends on what value you're getting in return. There's a book that you can read right now, everybody listening to, it's not my book. It's called uh, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. Mm. And that is probably one of the best things that I give to people now as a gift. And I usually get like, I'm in chapter two and I'm crying. Yeah, me too, motherfucker. It, it, it literally, I'm literally crying on a plane listening to this thing. But also why I suggest that book is because it explains how your children see you. And if you have interest in being a great parent, you should read that book. You might have a fantastic childhood, but you might be doing things that your kids are seeing that you don't even realize you're doing and you're fucking them up for the future. So mm-hmm. if there's anything we're investing in that has value, I try to correlate it back to children because any parent's going to say, yeah, I want to invest in my kids. Well, then invest in your kids. And you could start by reading that book. How invested are you? It's painful to read a book. It sucks sometimes. But I got to tell you, when you're done and you're a great parent, so you trade it off seven hours of an audio book or 10 hours of reading it, but you got a lifetime of value back where your mm-hmm. kids will regard you as the best parent you could have ever hoped for. Wasn't that worth it? Was there value there? That's insane. Uh, I just saw... Uh, um a thing on Instagram and I just want to see if I can, if I can find it really, really quick. Cause it was a, uh, it was a, a statement just all about that. Now, I used to read a lot and I, I, I do mostly audio books now, which I think is what you're doing a lot too. Yeah. I, that's all I do. Um, I, I used to like back in the day before there was all the digital shit. I'd be like uh, traveling. I'd have three, four books on all tape. Time. And I would, and I, and I would, and it's weird because I, I didn't need to finish a book. I could multitask it in my brain, even though they say you can't multitask. I think uh, uh, crazy entrepreneurs do it anyhow. We figured out how to juggle it all, but, but I could read fiction like for thirty minutes, put that down, immediately shift to a nonfiction, and I was always reading two, three uh, books at a time. But there was something I can't find it now, but. Uh, this, this thing I saw online where this, this woman said uh, um, the reason she's saying, Oh, here it is. You can't, you can't really see it, but you can see the, yeah. uh, so it says it is thanks to my evening reading alone that I'm still more or less sane. <laughs> like, it was re- re- reading and listening to, to other smart people's uh, work is, is, is super powerful. Um, very, I, I, what the hell? Oh, we're good. We're here. Yeah, I just completely disappeared there for a second. That was crazy. Um, the uh, the uh, you went off on a crazy tangent that I love there. Um, uh, it didn't really. There's there's a there's a, a an apathy and a laziness issue with a lot of cops incredibly I think overweight. a lot of people in general I, I'm going to jump in here and say we often we correlate this because we're in this industry I think people are apathetic and lazy across the fucking board okay, as humanity there, there yeah so I stand corrected and and uh, uh you just made as it was coming out and you said that I realized that it's it's uh I wrote an article for uh uh Caliber Press years ago where I said like like if you wanted to get on a football team and you had to go to the tryouts you wouldn't show up out of shape you would try your hardest. You'd fucking work your ass off, whatever your sport is. And I said, but like law enforcement game day is every day. You could be in a fucking run for your life, a death match, a high speed t- chase. You're a tactical athlete and, and you're not just playing, you know, 10 games and you got the summer off. It's fucking every day. Why aren't you, why aren't you in shape all the time? And uh, so I've been trying to motivate cops and i agree with you like you know it's like me saying you know hey look at this barber he's out of shape hey look at this dentist he's out of shape people are out of shape they don't realize how important their physical and mental fitness is but for law enforcement it's just fucking nuts you know the great dan gable uh you know uh, one of the best wrestlers in the world american icon he said if it's important do it every day uh I would love to see, and this is just more of a rhetorical thing: is how do we? It doesn't, and it doesn't need an answer. How do we? How do we inspire police officers to take their tactical fitness so much more seriously? Um, but you know, you, you work out. How often do you work out, Dennis? I try to week. stay consistent. Uh, 
typically 12 to 14 times a week. It's, it's insane. That's amazing. It doesn't look like yeah, it. Okay. Anyway. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Wait, let me just say this. Like, there are so many more reasons for why it's done than what people think the reasons are. And Correct. I always tell people this. I am never comparing myself to anybody else but me. So if I know there's anything left in the tank and I'm not using it or I'm making excuses, like, I'm not kidding you. I'm like, why can't you work out three times a day? Right? Like, is that possible? Now, right now, uh, I mean, it would be, but I, I wouldn't be able to at the moment. But I think about that, right? And then people say, well, you work out 14 times a week. You know, it's pretty consistent. That's a lot. That's crazy. Um, but it's really not. And it's funny because, like, the mindset is, like, people get offended by that. Like, oh, because if you work out three times a week and you think you're doing good, it's very offensive that somebody else is working out 14 times a week. And then I'll say this following statement that I think then you work out one time a day, seven days a week. I think that you're in maintenance mode. I think there's no growth. So okay. for me, there's no growth at maintenance. Um, and I don't see the results that I am pretty much addicted to, not only physically, but mentally. And the best right. stuff happens to me while I'm working out. Um, I'm 41, Tone. You're 60, 63 now, right? Yeah. So longevity is on my mind for the first time. I'm willing to trade off extra because on January 1st, 2023, when I had to go to the emergency room because I thought I broke my arm for being a silly daddy uh, and doing some wild shit because that's what we like to do at the Benito <laughs> household, right? I mean, I carry a, a big insurance policy. Trust me, we've got a lot of crazy shit going on at that place. Um, I looked around and it was just a stark reminder of why health is so important and even the extra mm -hmm. effort. And I see, you know, like just... People, it's January for it's New Year's Day. My feet hurt, my back hurts, and they're overweight and look like shit, and they're complaining. This is their life. They live in hospitals. Right. And I thought to myself, I, I hope that I'm one of those guys at 99 when they're like, you're not going to believe this motherfucker's still doing. He's still getting six in a week, you know? And I'm not some naturally gifted athlete. I am not. I, bro, I came from some of the worst physical genetics that you could ever imagine. Sometimes I look at myself like, in the mirror with no shirt on. I'm like, I see my father. I'm like, Oh Christ. I see my mother's like awful posture. I'm like, fuck dude. Like, <laughs> but you know, I, 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 there's many reasons beyond what people think it is. It's not to say, ha ha ha. I can do it. And you can't. Um, it has a lot to do with just me and what I like to be and what I like to look like and what I like to feel like and what I want to be in the future. And you know, um, I think there's, 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 a, there's plenty of reasons we can go through that I probably have too many to list, and I probably have to put a little more thought into it. No, I dig but it. Let me also say this. I know that you asked yeah. this question about how many times do I work out. I wrote something down that I'm going to tweet after this, and it probably has to be just adjusted a hair, but I wrote, I'm lucky that I was not killed for the days that my head was not in the game. Mm. And I promised myself at a certain point, because like, I would go to work hungover, right? because I was a fucking young boy, Partying up, cop in Jersey. We were like, you know, like we were like fucking superstars here, bro, because it was so hard. Like, believe me, being a cop in New Jersey was like being a celebrity for for a lot of people. You really, the, the women, it was fucking pretty cool. Um, you know, we just, we, it was, if you knew a cop, fuck, being one was unbelievable. And even knowing one was a huge leverage piece. And we got treated like kings, right? Free alcohol, free Good entrance. Top yeah. priority. All this stuff was like people couldn't do enough for you. It was it was fantastic. Uh, you felt great, but so you could drink. And I remember like saying to myself, like, man, I hope nothing pops off today because my head's not. I'm fucking hungover. Like having and you know, as I got older, I remember having a bad mental health day at work. And I called my sergeant. I said, Greg, I have to go home. And he goes, Well, why? I said, Well, I'm gonna pull a blue card. We call them blue cards. I'm gonna pull a blue card. Write it up. I go, uh, if I tell you, you're you're gonna get concerned. But I just. I'm not supposed to be here today, right? And, and in the state that I'm in mentally, it's not suicidal. I'm just not here, and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put anybody's lives in danger, uh, even mine as well. So let me just go home, reset, and I'll come back tomorrow like a million dollars. Like the Dennis Benino, you always know, the guy you can depend on. The guy when the tones come out, you know that I'm fucking throwing everybody I'm eating dinner with to the side, and I'm in that car, and I'll be there faster than anybody, even though I'm across town. You want that guy today? He's not. He doesn't exist. So let me mm -hmm. let me go home and sleep this one off. I got things going on in my personal life uh, that you know I, I thought I was that I could handle, but not today. And you know, just just understand that. So anyway.
But that, but that's also you just that's amazing self awareness. It, it's so funny how many of your your stories correlate with things that that I've taught. We 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 run a course called the Tactical Trainer. I spend most of my time trying to inspire trainers to do better. Uh, one of our one of our first slides in our course is don't show your students what you can do; show them what they can do. Like this isn't about you; it's about them. And uh, and I would I would when I would do courses, I'd say if you had one of the guys on your SWAT team going through a divorce, just found out, you know, his kid's a kleptomaniac, another one's sleeping around, uh, wife wants to leave him, he's not sleeping, he's sleeping on the couch, he's all fucked up, uh, would you want him to share that with the team? And uh, everyone, initially, we go, fuck no. I go, but he's point, or he's number three on the team, and he hasn't slept properly in a week. Like, what? why can't you have that self-awareness that says, dude, I'm going to breach today because if I go in first, like, like, my head's not here. And I loved what you said, but you can't do that if you don't have the confidence, the clarity, and, and that self-awareness to say, hey, Greg, this isn't the dentist you can rely on today, and I don't want to compromise uh, a mission of the safety of the public or a partner or myself. And so kudos to you and, and, and hats off for that. Um, you know, that's that, that's that psychological thing, but there's, that's part of the culture and, and a lot of places you just can't have that conversation. You know, people will, will, will shit on you. There's a lot that we need to fix in this community. Um, and I'm glad you're doing, uh, what you're doing. Uh, three last things here, and then we'll see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, <clears throat> any the crazy crazy time what's what's the street cop message for today's journalists that are so fucking critical of law enforcement what what could we do there to have the pendulum swing for journalists and their uh, their lack of understanding of what what you all have to deal with there is nothing to explain because it's no different than me saying to you, if you're Jewish, hey, you know what? I think you should be Muslim. And you go, but I'm Jewish. Go, no, no, but Muslims where it's at, man. Like you guys don't, you're not seeing our side of it. Um, and when you understand the bigger picture of how journalists are employed by these big, big organizations to push an agenda and a narrative, and at the top level, what I'd say like conspiracy theorists, to generate significant amounts of revenue, it's almost like, there is nothing personal about it because it's all business in some sense. Mm. They cannot be spoken to. So don't waste your time, energy, and effort trying to change the minds of people who are not willing to change their minds. They're not even willing to listen. So trying to convince the unconvincible is a futile effort, and I highly recommend don't even get involved. And if you're somebody and got to learn a lesson the hard way, let me, let me help you with my lesson the hard way. As much as you think that they are willing to listen to you, they are a wolf in sheep's clothing, and they are going to fucking stab you in the back. Uh, and journalists cannot be trusted, even the ones you think may be on your side. You know, you, unless you know for sure, they're uh, looking for an cannot be just because they're not because they're not in charge. Just so you know, the journalist on the street is not in charge. And then there's just some copycats who try to be like these little bullshit journalists. But for these big media outlets, they're not in charge, folks. They're told. When the Jeffrey Epstein thing came out, um, there was an ABC anchor who wanted to break this story, and they brought it up, and it was thrown off the desk and put in the garbage. So we got this guy, da da da, and the top, I don't know, NBC or ABC executives because right, they would remember that. That got thrown. That was they they found out about that, but it was tossed in the garbage. So don't forget who's in control of what they want you to see. Um, you know, and it's clear as day with modern day politics. Uh, who the fuck is in charge? And it's people on. So, uh, they don't care. I've even tried to have talks with people. They just don't care. And when you put the truth in their face, they still don't care. You want to know why? I heard this a long time ago, and it's great. You can't make sense to a crazy person. Why well, try? Okay. Um, fair enough. Message to citizens out there. And what I'm talking about, like the like defund the police, anti-police rhetoric. Uh, uh, like if you were going to put on at, at your 
conference one day, you know, okay, journalists, you're not invited. Okay, one day, just people, people in the community here. This is what we do. Get to know us. Have a little bit more empathy. Is there is there any message or any any talking point as far as what what we need our citizens to understand about law enforcement? I think that ninety nine point nine percent of this country really really likes the police, and it's a very binary thing. So you either hate them or mm-hmm. you love them. Good news for us is. Most people and a far more majority than people think, because, again, you're only seeing these bits and pieces right. of what they want you to see to 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 stir this rhetoric up. Um, it never hurts to remind a cop that you appreciate them. Hmm. And I think that's I think that's beautiful in of itself. And and sometimes saying to them, like, hey, man, I, I like thank you for taking care of this. And, and And the same message to the police is don't forget that's. I'm not talking about the person who's like, I pay your fucking salary. I pay my taxes. I'm talking like. These are the people we are here to serve and don't forget who it, the work that you're doing, the professionalism that you bring, the care that you bring to this job. That's who deserves it. So stop getting frustrated. Think that everybody, everybody hates your guts because we know that they do not. Now, mm-hmm. you might have a guy from a part of a, you know, West Side Chicago and they're like, everybody hates our guts. Like there may be some truth to that. But there's also truth to the fact that I think it's just a variable of a ratio and it just changes a little bit in a, in a, in a, in a setting like that. Yeah. But we can't have an us versus them mentality. And, you know, you can't consider all these people your adversaries because they are misunderstanding you a little bit. So it's our job to ensure that we serve them regardless of their position and opinion on us. And I'm guilty of it. You know, I'm a human being. I've fucked up before in the past. And I'm just here as a more senior guy now to tell you that, Hey, look, there's a better way to do this. And you don't got to start pulling the emotion out of it. It's just trying to see things from all different sides. It's, man, we had something happen yesterday. And I said, well, let's stop for a second. Let's yank the emotion out of this thing, breathe a little bit. We'll come back around to this in 10 minutes, right? So there's that famous saying, like, don't just stand there, do something. And I will quote Seth Godin by saying, don't do anything, just stand there. Ah, I love right? it. Yeah, so it's a big thing. So you've got it. That's a real emotional intelligence is probably one of the best things you can you can learn to develop for yourself. I think it pays off in dividends, and you're really going to like your life if you understand how to behave emotionally. Mm, I dig that. You kind of answered the last part of this was like, what is the message to cops? And you started to 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 get to get into that. So I don't know if let you want to let me throw that. one more thing in there. What's message for cops? Like, it's okay to love your job. It's okay to be different. It's okay to care. It's okay to want to arrest bad guys, um, and and you should not forget what your role is. So when you're having a shitty day and there's a kid choking down the street and you don't want to pay attention to the radio or you want to turn it down or go hide under a tree or whatever it may be because you're having a bad day, this job, albeit you have to take care of yourself and there's things about you that you need to take care of first, it is not about you. This is not a job that we need you to show up and do work. We need you to show up and fulfill the promise you made that you're going to give a fuck and be there for my family when we get run off the road into a tree and it's on fire. And there's a chance that if you have enough energy and enthusiasm to get there, you'll be able to put it out and save a child's life. But we don't think like that uh, that often. We're dissuaded from that thinking. But Hmm. that's where the real motivation comes from. So when you show up to work tomorrow, the next day, don't lose sight of people, many of them innocent, need you in the worst times of their life and you better show up with complete selflessness because that's what you promised to do and the minute you don't do that you have betrayed what you promised you said you would do i'm not saying you betrayed the badge but you're saying like Mm -hmm. you said you would be here so show up and be who we need you to be heavy man dude i love it there's no real questions in the audience uh just people enjoying it little comments there um, Elisa, uh, put up for those of you guys, if you're, you're, if you're listening to this, every one of you knows a cop, a firefighter, EMS, somebody in public safety, uh, please share this talk with them. I think, you know, while you were, while you were doing the last little bit about showing up, showing up, fulfill your promise. I was thinking about me as a dad. I was thinking about my company and my team. I was thinking about when you shared the, the, the Seth's comment about don't just stand there, do something. No, just don't just stand there. Don't do so. <laughs> or what was the reverse? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, you'll figure uh, it out. You just think about it yeah. a little bit. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, 
the, the just how many times like the fire happens and I'm there going fucking shit as opposed to just watch it for a second it'll burn out itself and that's the metaphor is the emotion in you the fire in you uh, um, th- there's so much to take out of this podcast outside of law enforcement uh, you're a very interesting human uh, and I'm, I'm excited uh, at how fast we've gotten to know each other and I, I love our banter and I love what you're doing and, and, and I'm going to promote you and street cop any way I can through, through our resources. Cause I think, uh, um, I think it's fucking amazing. Um, Thanks man. I really, it's really nice of you to say. And I, I, I acknowledge that you said that to me and uh, it means a lot. Um, and sometimes for me hearing that I unpack it a little bit later. So don't think that I am not thankful for you saying such nice things about me and the sentiment is, is equal. And I think you're a wonderful person and a, and a friend and a good person. And I think that we are probably, as you uh, said many times before, very, very similar people and sometimes misunderstood, but I think our hearts are in the right place. So I want to acknowledge you for that as well. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. Okay, guys, uh, share this tag, your, 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 especially your cop friends, let them know about the uh, street cop training. Alisa, put that, uh, that link up again. Yeah. Great. Even easier, streetcop.com. And if you go into Google and put in street cop training, everything that we do, every social media platform, TikTok, Instagram, uh, we have private groups for law enforcement, almost 100,000 members, free training. You could join our website. Guys, you're going to find out that most of it's free and because there's a why behind it. And then if you feel like it's worth it and you trust us, which a lot of people do, uh, we will see you at one of our classes. And I promise you, you'll be thankful that you showed up. Yeah. Okay, man, I'm going to end this broadcast. Stay on a minute because the files need to upload. Dennis will chit chat a little bit off the scene, uh, behind the scenes. And uh, all of you get back to work. It's the middle of the day, except for all our friends in Europe watching this. Stay safe, everybody.